guys, I have a special treat for you today. I've been telling you this all along. We've been in this Who Am I series. If you're a guest here today, we are so glad that you are worshiping with us today. We're actually wrapping up a series. We've been doing a series answering questions that just burn on the human heart. Who am I? And and what comes out of that? Who am I when I don't measure up? Who am I when I failed? And we've done five different topics. Today, we're going to close out the series with the author of the book that we've been doing, uh, Pastor Jeff Little from Milestone Church in Texas. And before we go on, I just want to tell you guys a little bit uh, about Pastor Jeff. He started the church with just a couple of, of people in a living room in 2002. Now there are about 7,000 people in one of the toughest places to start a church, in my opinion. And by that, I don't mean like it, it, it's all a, an atheist world or anything like that. What I mean is all of the greatest pastors and churches have churches across the street from him. The toughest, I don't know, I mean, what what were you thinking? Like, I'm going to start a church across the street from everybody that's on television. So if he can do that, I just tell you, that says a lot about him. But here's another thing. Uh, I've known Pastor Jeff for a couple of years, and and about a year ago, uh, we were getting ready to do this build. We were in the process of this building, and some things didn't go the way that we wanted them to go financially. Many of you have been hearing about that over time, and, and, and the good news, when 2018 ended, so did all of our uh, being behind. Wasn't that cool? Uh, God met all of those needs before the year ended. Yeah, you can clap for that. But when, when I was ask, asking Pastor Jeff for some advice about a year ago, he actually called me back and said, hey, you know what? Milestone wants to stand with Grace Life and be a part of it. So here's the thing. Uh, I'm not going to give you numbers, but I'm going to tell you this. Pastor Jeff Little and Milestone Church were the biggest supporters of Grace Life outside of Grace Life during that season. And so what that tells you, what that tells you is today we've got family in the house. Got his son Caleb right here. So if you would, help me give the best Grace Life welcome we can to Pastor Jeff Little, everyone. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's a, it's, it really is my honor to be here, and it is, it's humbling to me to think some folks from South Carolina have been going through this little book that I wrote and studying it in your living rooms and at coffee shops and uh it's just, a, it's just an honor to see you and to meet you, see your great faces. And so uh, it's really my honor and privilege, and I hope you will receive me like family because I already feel that already just worshiping with you. Um, I love your pastor. Uh, he and the team have come to a little uh, event we have at the first of every year where we just love to sow into pastors and churches. And how many of you know Jesus has one plan for South Carolina? And that is his church. I mean, I've I've read the book, okay, and he has a plan and he works through his church. And uh, all of us, I I sometimes wonder why he didn't get a better strategy with all of our imperfections, but uh, he still uses the church. And so um, our church family loves just investing in churches like you and helping people. We love investing in your pastor because he's hungry. He's a man of integrity. Every time I've met him, I can see a sincerity and an authenticity in him. And by worshiping with you, I can tell that's, that's part of the culture here, Pastor Jimmy. And I want to tell you guys, don't lose that. Don't, don't lose that. It's significant. By the way, when you're on the, on the inside of something you lose sight of, I want us to give God one more round of applause for this great building. It's, you look, it's, it's not about buildings. But God uses barns to reach lost sheep and take care of sheep. Come on now. So he gave you a little tire barn, all right, and yet just thousands of square feet. And it's a miracle. And I know many of you are new to the Grace Life family, have come in the last few months. And uh, it's just significant what God's doing here. And I just want to encourage you to continue uh, with the heart and the innocence and the authenticity that I sense here as you continue to grow. Because people are hungry to meet authentic people. When they meet authentic people, it's a doorway to meeting an authentic Jesus who can really change their lives. I want to talk to you just a little bit about this who am I, a little bit about my journey. Um, I learned that this was a big question in my life on my journey. Really, the book that I wrote is really a lot of my own journey and uh, my own journey as a pastor from a young age. I got saved in my home at 12 years old around my family dinner table. I like to say it took, come on now, uh, I, 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 it took, it was real. 
Now, what I didn't expect was six months later, I was in my bedroom, had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And God called me into ministry, okay? He said, I'm calling you into ministry. Now, it was interesting in my home because my mom was an intercessory prayer warrior. Come on now, how many of y'all thankful for the moms and grandmas that prayed us all into the kingdom? Most mornings I woke up, my mom was there, had her prayer journal praying for us kids. My dad was an engineer, pocket protector, mechanical pencil. Come on now, anybody know anybody like that? Had a drafting table in the house, you know, and so 12 years old, you know, I had this moment with God. I walked out into our family room, had a big crocodile tears in my eyes. I said, I think I'm called to ministry. My mom said, thank you, Jesus, I knew it. My dad said, sit down, boy, we need to diagram this for a minute. Hold on a minute. We need to find out what's going on. In my home church, I love the next generation because I believe you don't have to wait to be great. In our children's area, I have a sign that says you don't have to wait to be great. You can be a great kid. God in the Bible, we see that he uses people at all stages and he'll use young people. 16 years old, my pastor started letting me preach. So I didn't know this, but then I went on to Baylor University. Now, some of y'all don't know about that. Y'all got the Gamecocks here, all that kind of thing. This is Central Texas, the Brazos River. And we call it Jerusalem on the Brazos at Baylor University. It's that God's presence dwells there. I just want y'all to know that. So, so I went there <laughs> and, uh, and, and at 21 years old, I was the youth pastor in a church and the pastor decided to get a master's degree in history and he left the pastorate and there I was, the youth pastor started preaching. I became the senior pastor at 21 years old. Just crazy. Now I didn't say I was a good one. There were these people going, I don't think we can follow you. I thought, I wouldn't follow me. I don't think I would follow me. Nonetheless, I started pastoring at 21 years old. So a lot of what I'm sharing with you, I want you to understand it. It comes out of my own journey with God in being a young pastor, being called to ministry early, living my life with people. I've lived with people. So these issues that we're talking about, I've dealt with them in walking with the real lives and the real challenges and insecurities and comparisons in my own story, but also in the stories and the lives of people. So these are, these are, these are real things to me as we, as we talk about it. And so as we look at this, who am I though, I want to tell you where the big place that I've learned a lot about the questions, and that is in my own family. Because I'm going to talk to you today about who am I with my family. Well, I'm in that with you, okay? I'll show you a little picture of my family here. Here's my family. Um, I got, I got a, a, a whole host of them now. I got my oldest there, the blonde there. She's my daughter, Hannah Grace. She's a freshman at Baylor now, so she's in college. My son, Caleb, he's actually on the front row here. Very proud of him. He's a senior. He's about to go and study to be a missionary, so he's looking for anyone who wants to be on his support team today. He'll be taking names and numbers from anyone that wants to join him. But uh, anyway, that's my son, Caleb. And then my other daughter there to my right there on the bridge, your left, that's Lauren Elizabeth. She's in junior high. And then the baby there, Lainey Kate, means bright light. She's in elementary. I got college. Just notice, college, high school, junior high, and Lainey Kate in elementary. Somebody say, pray for him, Lord. Are y'all with me? Okay. <clears throat> And, and I'll tell you, talk about, we, I know one week you talk about insecurity, talking about who am I? Nothing can create the level of insecurity. You know, you just, these, these little things are born and you're just like, what do I do? You know, I'm responsible for this human life. My oldest, and I've found that it just continues. Some of you have kids at different ages. It doesn't end. The, the, the concerns, the challenges doesn't end because my daughter there that I showed you, the blonde, she's in college. And, and I remember the other day she drove off from the house. By the way, when they drive away in motorized vehicles, I'm telling you, that's the scariest thing. She drove off and there I was. I become my dad. I'm standing on the front porch. I got my shirt off. Don't picture it. And there I am and she drove off and I'm waiting for her to come back. And she drove up out there in the cul-de-sac and I looked and she's missing her right front hubcap. She's missing the hubcap. She gets all her stuff. She's bebopping up the sidewalk there. And I'm like, Hannah Grace, where's your hubcap? Now I'm, I'm looking for an intelligent answer. A, a semi-intelligent answer, a, 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 a practical answer. That's not what I got. I said, where's your hubcap? She, she looked at me and, and, and she gave this answer. Dad, what's a hubcap? <laughs> I, I, I'm concerned. 
I, I'm concerned, okay? So, so sometimes we're dealing with things, and we've learned this in this Who Am I series, we're dealing with things we don't even know the right questions to ask, but we do know this. We're asking the Who Am I question. We're always asking it. We don't like to admit that we're asking it. And why is it significant? I know you guys have been in your homes and you've been studying and you've been thinking about this. I want to make sure this last week, we really anchor this so that we can carry it forward. Because this who am I question is so important. Because how you see yourself, it begins to shape what you believe. It begins to be the movie picture that you watch every day. And what you believe will dictate how you act. And how you act will form your habits. It will form your patterns for life. And those patterns and habits will form your future. So it all starts back here with this understanding of who am I really very important. I saw this in the life in this series. We've, we've done it in our church and lots of churches like you have done this series. So I've, I've got sort of just a different, I got a whole host of testimonies, but one that really, really touched me is this lady named Crystal. She, she had a major, major moment where she was in a car accident. Her name is Crystal Riggs and she woke up after this car accident in ICU. Did not know what happened, but she had been burned on a big portion of her body, her neck, her arms, her shoulder. She spent 45 days afterwards unwilling to look in the mirror. She didn't want to look in the mirror because she just was so ashamed and she knew she was burned and didn't know what, what would happen in the future. But in the middle of that, after having a place where she gets some healing, she goes to church and she comes during the Who Am I series. She gets saved. She gets water baptized and then she begins to shape her understanding of who she really is through the Who Am I series. After that, which is what happens when you really get changed and you really possess the truth, and this really becomes part of who you are, you give it to someone else. And that's what I'm going to ask all of you to do. Give this away that you've learned because so many people are struggling with it. And she reached out to us and said, hey, I'm so impacted by this, have been so impacted I want to go into hospitals and burn units, and I want to do who am I Bible studies with people that are struggling with burn issues. And so we, we, we have supplied for her all the books that she wants for free to do these Bible studies and burn units. I want to talk to you today a little bit more about who am I, but I want us to think about it in the context of family, these very important relationships. And, and, and the, the way a culture is today, by the way, it's more intense, this who am I question. And, and we don't, again, we, we hide it a little bit under the surface, but, but, but dads struggle with the who am I question. Dads are facing this pressure, and when we start talking about even the home and family, I'm very excited, Pastor, about your new series, and, and I know it's going to impact a lot of people, but when dads come into a series like that, they realize, wait a minute, I have a responsibility here. You come in a church where you hear, we want you to be men of God. And see, men lean toward what they feel successful at. So, so men, they know how to get the number. They, they know how to pursue the career. They know how to head toward the trophy, the bucket list. But you come in a church and say, we want you to be a man of God. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, don't, I don't know how to do all that now. I, don't, I, I feel a little insecure about that. I don't, I don't know what to do, but there's, there's pressure. Moms have a lot of pressure today in the home. Moms have a lot of pressure with just being moms. I'm not, and, and, and totally not saying that it's relegated only to moms who stay at home because now we have many ladies in the workforce. And so you have the work things, you have the home things, you have the children things, you have all the pressure of culture and then you got to get everything just right. And you got to raise prodigy kids. And of course you then have to have that Instagram photo of that blueberry scone that you made with all natural ingredients with essential oils on the side and then the sunlight shining on it. Hallelujah. <laughs> pressure, pressure, pressure. Young adults have pressure. Pastor Jimmy just mentioned it. Now I'm single, you know. Look, if you come to this series, you'll get married. I'll just tell you that. Everybody's like, I'm in, I'm in. Praise the Lord, you know. <clears throat> but it's challenging for single adults, right? I've, I've been a bridesmaid like 15 times. When's it my time? A lot of pressure to achieve, a lot of challenges. I'm going to talk to you in a minute about teenagers having so much pressure and challenge. Children carrying a different level of pressure and not knowing who they are and how they relate in family and all of the challenges there. Some of you are like, Jeff, well, that's cool, all these different stages. I'm an empty nester. <clears throat> I got my kids out of the house and hopefully off the payroll. Somebody say, <laughs> they're off the payroll. Praise the Lord. 
Did you know I find empty nesters even still struggle with their identity and how they relate in family and what their purpose is? I want to encourage you with this. If we re really read the story of the Bible, God not only says you're never too young, God also says it's never too late. 80 years old, Moses walked into his destiny. All kinds of people. So you have a purpose and a role. And by the way, in a church like this, that's wanting not just to build a gathering, but a spiritual family, those of you that are empty nesters, can I encourage you with this? You're like, I feel a little bit guilty because I would have done some things different in my own home. Well, here's the cool thing about being in a church that builds spiritual family. You get even some other opportunities to help us with all the places that you messed up. You get some other opportunities for young adults that are coming in this church who need parental figures, who need spiritual moms and dads. We need you in the game. It's not time to retire and go live on a beach somewhere. The kingdom of God needs you to be a part of what God's doing here. All different phases and stages, we still ask the question, who am I? I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Genesis. If you've never opened the Bible, that's the first book. You're in luck, okay? First chapter, okay? I'm making it easy for you, okay? Genesis 127 and 128 as we look at this foundation of who am I in my family, okay? Now, I know when we say family, that's a painful place for a lot of people, okay? Okay? As painful as it is, we're still all designed for it. We all still want it. We're all born into a family. We don't get to pick the family that we're born into. We get brought into this thing. Then we have a longing for a family. We spend money. We pray prayers. We go on dates. We try to find our soul mate. Whether that's real or not, we're trying to find this perfect one. Are you with me? Then we wake up the next day and realize, okay, even if they're our soul mate, it's going to come with some work. Are you with me? That's what you're about to talk about. And then when we kind of get it down, here come these little expensive needy creatures. Are you with me? And you get one. And I, I just get amazed at these young couples. You know, it's like, we're busy. Brother, one kid's a hobby. <laughs> That's a hobby. That's an accessory. <laughs> then, then they start bringing reinforcements and ganging up on you. You know what I'm saying? You got to go, you know, from man to man to zone, you know, because it's a basketball illustration for everybody. But anyway, so now you're just, you have to start. And, and, and what happens is life just starts happening and we start walking through this family situation and we feel a little under-equipped and we're trying to deal with it and we don't a lot of times even know where to start. So I'd like to start us at the foundation level, okay? And, and, I, and I'm gonna be elementary for a reason because some of you are gonna be like, okay, pastor, that's common sense. You know, that, okay, we got you on this. But there's a lot of people today. There's a lot of questions today. What is the family? Is that just a collection of people who decide to do it? Is that just a group of people who stand before the pastor and get pronounced as now a family? What is it? What's God's plan? What's God's design? Because if you're going to really build a family that has a strong identity that can face the pressures of the culture of the world, you've got to have a foundation that's anchored to something substantial. And I recommend doing it God's way. I recommend God's foundation. And there's a good possibility some of you are struggling with some things. Okay, look, let's go back to the foundation. The foundation's always the most important part of whatever you're building. Thank God for this thing. I was walking around with your pastor, 70,000 square feet. Let me just tell you, this would have taken millions of dollars to build from the ground up. A few years ago, we built a large building, 54 and a half acres. It took a long time to do it. And one of the things I was amazed by in the building process was I would go out there, my kids got tired of it. You know, you know a pastor's building a building, you just go every day, you know, what happened, what happened, what happened? We'd drive around it. And one of the things I was really amazed by was when they were starting to pour the slab of the foundation, it took the longest amount of time. They were injecting water out there. They weeks of injecting water, getting the soil right, taking samples. There were soil sample companies that stayed on site to daily test the soil to make sure that it had a good foundation. And so it is in your life. If you are going to answer correctly, who am I with my family, you have to have a solid foundation. Here's the foundation of the Bible. Genesis 1 says, so God created mankind in his own image. 
God created us in his image. That's where we start the identity of the family. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then it says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it. From the identification that we're created in the image of God, God brings us together in family based on our identification from his mark, his stamp, his creation to, towards us in his image. And then from that, we are able now to be blessed, to be fruitful, and to have authority in the earth. There's an authority that comes from the identification we have from who created the thing in the first place. If you continue on in the chapter, you read in chapter two, God brings, he says it's not good that man is alone. He brings him a wife. He then brings them together. The Bible says in the New Testament, what God has joined together, let no man separate. It's on that foundation that God begins to build the family. I wanna show you something else though that's very powerful because the family, why would we talk about identity and talk about the family? It's because the family is the greatest microcosm the greatest laboratory, the greatest cultural environment to shape identity. It's that place where it gets stamped on you over and over and over. It's the place where you reinforce what we just read. And I wanna give you one of the verses that my wife and I love that we've used for years and we think about this a lot of times and that is this, Deuteronomy 11 says this, fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them around your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. So when you start getting anchored to God's foundational picture for the home, for the family, for your identity in him, brings you together. You begin to get his principles, his precepts, his foundation. Here's what I wanna encourage you with. When you walk along the road, when you're in the car on the way to school, when you're living out life, when you sit at home, you begin to reinforce that foundation in that culture, in that environment over and over and over. And it builds strength. Because I'm gonna tell you, building family is a full contact sport. The devil's coming against every single part of it. There's challenge. Look, this is not, some of you are like, listen, here's what I find as a pastor. Can I, can I be transparent with you on my first time with you? It's what we care about the most, but we focus on the least a lot of times. It's the thing we care about the most, but we focus on the least. And I want to encourage you, a little bit of Jesus is not going to cut it. You know, you can't say, well, I'm going to kind of be over here, do my own thing. I'm not going to really build on that foundation, but, but look, I want to sprinkle a little Jesus on it. I'm just going to sprinkle a little Jesus on it. When you really talk about foundation, he's the chief cornerstone. He's what we build upon. He's what we're trying to anchor to. So it's not a little sprinkle Jesus it's I've got to go full on, full in with Jesus. That's, that's the number one thing. If you sat with me for marriage and counseling and helped me with my home, my first question would not be techniques. My first question is, are you all in with Jesus? Amen. Are you all in with Jesus? Because he's the answer that you're looking for. He's the foundation that you want to build upon. I want to talk just for a minute about how does our family influence our identity? How does this environment called the family, how does it influence our identity? And some of you are like, Jeff, I'm way off course. Look, here's some encouragement. It's amazing what God can do when you really surrender it to him. It's amazing what he will do. I've had testimony after testimony after testimony of people who built on the wrong foundation and God's grace is sufficient to sometimes, he will come in. It is amazing what can happen when you begin to surrender this area of your life to him. Amazing. My dad, I think about it in my own life, just, just, just I think about the power and the influence that family can have on our lives. My, my, my dad, he, a few years ago, had a surgery, had colon cancer, had a surgery that, that went wrong and there was a tear in the colon. And I found myself at his bedside praying for him 
um, literally not knowing if he would live. I spent an entire day praying for him, and miraculously, God, God did a miraculous work. He went septic, and it was a long process, but God supernaturally um, just saved him and, and, and did amazing work. And I'll never forget that after that, you know, him talking to me about that really just on the, on the edge of death, and I'll never forget sitting there with him, um, and my, my, some of my pastor friends and some of my friends came and we were sitting there and, and, and one of them said, I think it's interesting, Jeff, I'd never really thought about this, that it's interesting, Jeff, that your dad never calls you by your name. He, he always calls you son. He always calls you son. I, and I thought, I'd never really thought about that. See, it's a, a real miraculous thing that my dad was able to be the kind of dad he was to me because his dad passed away in a car accident when he was nine years old. And he never had a dad. He was raised by a single mom. And I want to encourage some of you here who have different family dynamics. God's grace, if you'll build on his principles and foundation, can show, show up in even the most challenging of circumstances. But I began to think on that when one of my friends says, he calls you son. I, I began to think about how that had shaped me. And I remember even sitting with him during those moments when he was walking through that very challenging health crisis. And I remember some of the things that maybe he wanted to say along the way that he didn't always say, but we had some of those moments where he said, I'm proud of you. I'm thankful for you. We had some of those heart to hearts. Can I encourage some of you with something right now? In the family, do not underestimate the power that you have to speak into the identity of the people you love around you. Don't wait for a near death experience. Write the letter you need to write today. Use the words of affirmation that you need to use today. Tell the people around you today. Many times what we do is we lack in our ability to tell those people that we love, to shape those identity areas of their lives that we have so much influence in. We, we a lot of times wait and we're frustrated and we deal with the fruits of not saying it and we have to have all of these conflict moments. I wanna encourage you. You, no matter where you're at, the child, the teenager, the mom, the grandmother, you have a great power. And that is to speak into the identity of the people you care about most. You have a great power. How does this area of family influence our identity? Number one, your spouse shapes, not defines your identity. This is very important, okay? I know a lot of us, again, you're about to talk about it for a few weeks. Pastor Jimmy is okay. We think that if I can just find this person, all my identity issues are going to go away because this person is going to meet all of those needs that I have lacking in here. Okay. How many of y'all married somebody different than you? Anybody in here? Okay. My wife is so different than me. You know, I like it cold. She likes it hot. I like the mountains. She likes the beach. She loves for me to take her to the beach one time a year. I go to the beach. We sit on the beach. We sit on the beach all day on the beach. We watch the sun come up on the beach. I read a book. I read two books. By the third day, I'm a people person. I'm like looking for a volleyball with a face on it. Y'all remember that movie? I'm like, <laughs> it just, we're, we're so different. But you know what? If you stay with the one you chose, over time, you find out this, they can't fill the void in you because they're so different. They can't really meet the deepest needs of your soul, yet God will use them to shape some things in you. They're so different than you, guess what? You start liking the beach. You start eating stuff that you would never eat before. They start shaping things in you. And I'm going to tell you where it ends up. You look like each other one day. That's where it ends up. You start looking like each other. You know, it's just amazing. The Bible says he takes two individuals, they become one flesh. It's a beautiful thing. But your spouse was never designed to meet the deepest emotional needs that you have. Only God can do that. Only God can meet those identity needs. And here's what you find. When you answer the who am I question that you've been studying, when you get rid of comparison, when you get rid of insecurities, when you really find your identity in Jesus, when you're able to really say, I have nothing to prove, no one to impress, I am who I am by the grace of God. When that healing happens on the inside of you, here's what happens. You stop nagging your spouse. How's that working, by the way? really effective, isn't it? It's just effective. You never, you won't, you won't. And they just go, well, I'm glad you told me that. I really want to respond in a proper way. 
Ephesians 5 it lays it out real clear, by the way. There's a great book written on it by Emerson Eggers. It's, you know, men want respect. They want to be honored. You know what, ladies? If you'll champion your husband, you're the greatest man of God, dad. You're like, it's not true. I feel like I'm lying. Well, just say it anyway. You know what I'm saying? Just, <laughs> just say it. It's amazing how you'll see him rise up. Men, wives want to be loved with no strings attached. When you do that, you, you kill what Emerson calls the crazy cycle, the crazy cycle. What, what's, but the only way you can kill that crazy cycle where you just keep going around and she wants to be loved, but you don't know how to love her and you need respect and she doesn't know how to respect you and you're just in a whirlwind, how do you kill that? You've got to get anchored in your own identity. You've got to find your source in God. Then you can offer that. To your spouse. Here's number two. Number two, we'll talk about children. God entrusted parents with the primary responsibility to help their children discover their identity in Christ. You're like, what do I do with these little people? Well, of course you instruct. Of course you nurture. Of course you correct, direct, help, take care of, fix lunches, go to ball games, change diapers. But I want to give you a target for some of you that may not have it. Don't just parent your children, disciple your children. Disciple your children. You go, what does that mean? Disciple. Well, again, that's just, d d discipleship is a principle of, of learning and coaching and, and modeling. And, and, and you say, well, what do I do? Can I give you just one target? Help them discover their identity in Christ. Help them get to the anchor place that you found in Jesus. And by the way, why is marriage so important? Because as two people walk that out together, they create a stability and a place for children to live under the covering of that atmosphere and that environment. I want to encourage you with that because you have such a huge effect on your children as you do that. And, and, and I want to give you just one little parenting. I could talk about it forever and we don't have time. But, but one little thought, use non-confrontational moments with your children to be intentional about this. Did you notice what it said? When you walk along the road, when there's not a catastrophe, when we can't get to church because somebody lost their sock, not when there's a major family blow up, right? Not in the tense moment. You never, you should. In the non-confrontational moments, some of you parents of young children at their bedside at night when they're little, they're the most vulnerable and open to say words that shape, that come down in there as seeds and shape their identity. Here's number three. One of the areas that I know a lot of you are really looking for God to help you with, and that is identity is the key issue of your teenage years. And I'm going to tell you, it's always been challenging to be a teenager. It's probably more challenging than ever. Technology has changed the game. Technology has changed the game. I struggled with writing this chapter because I'm still raising kids. In fact, I think it's harder for pastors today, many times, to talk about children in that area than it was even for pastors 15, 20 years ago to talk about money. It's an area where people are struggling and pastors are in the fight and they feel challenged by it and no one has the corner on the market and we're struggling with how to speak and talk about it and deal with it and we know that you're dealing with it. I struggled with writing the chapter because I didn't want to come across as an expert, but I felt the pain of so many people. In fact, I took this chapter, I went to our local high school, I invited a cross section of kids to the library. I sat down at a table and I started asking them questions. Two to three minutes into the conversation, I was weeping. Listening to their pressures, I was like, tell me what you're dealing with. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm not that old, but you're dealing with stuff I didn't have to deal with. You know what? We left our problems at school. We went home, played with a stick. <laughs> what are we going to do? Go outside and play with a stick. Okay. Their friends come home with them. The world comes into their bedroom with them. And the pressure, I go, tell me, are we putting pressure on you? They say, we, we, we put enough pressure on ourselves. I mean, I've got to solve global hunger by the time I'm 19. I've got to solve the water crisis in Ethiopia and Tanzania. I've got to deal with all these things. Pressure, pressure, challenges. Teenage years. Identity explodes the identity crisis. 
You say, what do we do about it? Can I encourage some of you right now who are going to hit the teenage phase, some of you in the teenage phase, and I'm employing empty nesters, grandparents, and everyone here. The enemy's strategy is to distract you or reject you. Distract you from the investment you can make. I'm going to tell you, I've sat with many people on their deathbed. You know what they're not talking about? Their 401k. At the end of your life, that's not what you're going to be focused on. It's the people you care about the most. So don't let the goals you're trying to achieve distract you from the people you love the most. But why is parenting teenagers the hardest? Because inside of them as they're growing into young adults, they don't want to, but somehow it happens where they reject you. They reject because we hurt each other. So they portray rejection. And if you can't handle that, if you let that, why, is it, why do we have to have our identity in Christ? Our identity is not in our teenager. Our identity is not in the affirmation that our teenager gives us. Our identity is in Jesus, so now we can offer that. And when they need to tell us, you hurt me, you rejected me, you this, and they want to act like, get off of me. I don't need you. I'm fine. That's when you need to go give them a big hug. Just invade their space. I'm up in here, and I'm not going anywhere. No, no, don't let the enemy just pull them on off and just destroy them. Because that's what's going to, what the enemy go, well, I feel rejected. I don't leave them alone. Just leave them in the room. Leave them with their laptop. Leave them with their own world. No, 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 no. Wait up in there with your identity in Christ. Engage the system. Engage the process. I want to show you a little story. In this story... In the area of family and where do we really find our identity is a story, a modern day story of a biblical picture of family that we all find ourselves in this story. Luke chapter 15, very briefly, I want to give you the biblical story because I'm not assuming everybody knows the biblical story, but in Luke 15, we get a picture of the heart of God. And it's a story of a dad where a son comes and in Jewish culture, it would be as if he slapped his dad in the face, spit on him, because he says, give me my inheritance. He's rejecting him at the highest level. Takes the inheritance, goes off in what the Bible calls loose living. There's a moment, though, I love this little phrase in, in one of the translations, text that says, he comes to his senses. How many of y'all have somebody you're praying for that you just want them to have that come to your senses? Do you know deception is illogical? The heart justifies what the heart wants. And he's like, come to your senses, come to your senses. He does. He goes, you know, why am I in this pig pen? Because he's lost everything. Why am I living with all the, 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 I mean, the Bible says the pleasure of sin is but for a season. So they tell me I'm a pastor. I've never participated. <laughs> and, and he ends up in the, the breakdown of sin. But he turns and goes back to the father. And the father is a picture of God's heart for us. And he runs back to him. And I want you to watch this, thinking about the God that loves you, thinking about whatever breakdown is in your own family, and maybe thinking about the person that you're wanting to come to their senses. Watch this modern day picture of a great story and parable in Luke 15 of the loving father and the wayward son. Watch this with me, I'm gonna come back and pray for you. time since we talked, I was, you know, I was kind of hoping you'd answer, but um, you know, I understand that you probably don't want to talk to me. I've just gone so far, and the things I've done, I, I just regret it, you know? And I know how bad I've hurt you and let you down, but, but Dad, I, I miss you. 
miss how we'd drive around and just talk about life. And I just, I just want to come home. But I know you've probably written me off. I can't blame you, actually. Here's, here's, here's the thing. <laughs> it's kind of a shot in the dark, but I'm, uh, I'm coming through town soon, and, and I'd really just like to see you. I know I can't just show up at the front door like I used to, but, but if you want to see me, just hang a small sheet out on the porch. If the sheet isn't there, when I drive by, I'll keep going, and, and I'll try not to bother you anymore. I love you, Dad. if you would to stand on your feet and bow your head with me every head bowed and every eye closed family is a place that we care about deeply but we have to first understand the longing of our heart is to be in the family of God to know that we are loved by Him, that we are received by Him, that we are accepted by Him. There's a verse of Scripture that says that it's the love that God has for us that leads us to a place of repentance. Some of you say, what's repentance? That's, that's where you change. You literally do a total 180 and your whole life turns as you come into the arms of a loving God who loves you. That's really the story of Jesus. Jesus is the representation of God, the Son of God, the one who comes to make the payment that we could never pay. The Bible says if you'll confess Him as Lord, you'll receive Him, the Bible says you can be saved. So I want, if you're here and you say, Jeff, I've not ever really come into a place where I've really, I'm, I'm not right with Jesus. I've never really just said, Jesus, you can have it all. You can have me. I want to be in your family. You can have my family. I want to do a full jump into your arms. Then right where you are, you can simply say, Jesus, here I am. He, he knows where you are. In fact, he may have been drawing you, using people around your life. He knows where you are. Just simply say, Jesus, here I am. Just you and him. Real words. God, God wants real words, not some religious prayer. Here I am. I ask you to come into my life. I confess you as my Lord. You say it to him between you and him. I give you my life. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead. And I receive you today. Not as a religious figure, you and him. But as my Jesus. My Savior. My Lord, I receive you today. 
If you prayed that prayer, I'm not going to embarrass you and make you come forward in any way, but I would like to know who I prayed with. If you say, Pastor, I prayed that in a minute, would you just slip your hand up right where you are and say, I prayed that with you? I'm not going to embarrass you. Raise your hand if that's you. Thank you. Anyone else? Raise it up high so I can see it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask those of you, you can put your hand down. I'm going to ask if you prayed that prayer. The Bible says you're now a baby in Christ. You're a new creation. I'm going to ask you to engage with the grow track. I'm going to ask you to take steps that Pastor Jimmy's going to give you in a minute. You don't want to stay where you are. You need now. Don't let this just be an emotional moment. You need now the family of God, the church, the people around you to help you grow in that so that it's not just a moment but something you grow in. Second of all, before I go, I want to pray for those of you who say, Pastor, I got challenges in my family. Would you just pray for me? I'm not going to embarrass you, but would you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for my family. Just lift it up. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. Hands around this auditorium. I pray for the people with their hands lifted that they would identify themselves with you first and foremost. You would go down into their soul. The needs not met by an earthly father. The wounds that have come from a mother. The siblings that have hurt each other. The pain. Lord, we hurt each other. We don't even know we're hurting each other. We just do because it's just the way life works. We're broken people. But Lord, I pray that we could forgive. That we could let go. That we could receive today the love that comes from a father into our own souls. So that we have something to offer in those challenging situations. And I pray for prodigals right now. There are people in this room who have prodigals that are away. I pray for them in the name of Jesus. I pray right now you would arrest them even wherever they are. Wherever they are far from you, they're never outside of your reach. And we pray for them right now. We ask you to bring them home to your loving arms. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Grace Life. It was great being with you.